Philippa, hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Um, good to have you here. Um, I don't know if you want to bring that a bit closer to you. Say just, it again then. Yeah, just the, the mic, um, just so I can uh, make sure I hear you right. Um, so hello, hello, hello. Um, I mentioned this is episode 40, 40. Uh, we sat together 30 episodes ago. Um, a couple hundred miles away in London. <laughs> yes. uh, so we're back in Lincoln. So we're, we're in Lincolnshire. We're or? in Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire. Mm, Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire. Yes. Lincolnshire. Um, we're in a very cool um, recording studio here um, where you said even your son has recorded here the drums or a part of a band. Mm. Um, so it's a very cool room. So anyone watching on video, um, you'll see it. Nice warm feeling. Um not many guests we've had on the podcast more than once. Oh. Um, so it's an honor to have you back again. Um, well, it's a privilege to be a, a repeat guest. Thank you. Um, for me too. So I and I listened to a bit yesterday and finished it up this morning, um, our previous uh, podcast episode together, um, which was very funny listening to. And I started the last one by diving. I was being selfish and I dove straight into yoga um, I was fairly new back then into my yoga journey and I just wanted to pick your brain and see what you think about what I was thinking then. So then I listened to myself what I was thinking then and then me now a year later. Um, I couldn't even believe I asked you those stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so where am I? Uh, I'll start with yoga again. Oh, um, okay. I... I stopped going to my yoga studio that I was going to about three, four times a week uh, for almost a year. And I started just doing it myself, um, kind of not because I know better than anyone else, but I've seen many instructors and I've like picked a lot from a lot of them mm. and kind of made my own medley and <laughs> just trying to um, see if I can instruct myself through a 60 to 90 minute class um, and to see if I'm if I feel like I'm getting something out of it. What I have noticed is, number one, it's way, 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 way more difficult to start mm. the session mm. um, without, you know, someone waiting for you to start um, and you're, when you're on your own schedule. So I wanted to ask you if you give yourself, I know you teach people yoga, but will you do it for yourself Yes. Yoga, Pilates, yeah. really oh, all yes. the different classes that you do. Do you do it for yourself? That's how you work out? Will you give yourself a 60-minute class? <laughs> uh, well, I will approach the mat and really see where I'm uh, inspired to go. So that, for me, I'll probably end up mixing and matching a little bit. But it's interesting you asked me that question because over the holidays, I was having a break from teaching other people. And so I wasn't doing as much either myself. And so I, I approached the Met one day and uh, and I was called to do yoga. And that, that's what I did. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if if I really want to lose myself in movement, uh, then that's where I will go. Lose yourself in movement. Yes. Can you elaborate? Oh, because I think I think I know what you, you mean. Think you know what but I mean? Yeah, it's I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm not hundred percent sure that people will mm, know what you okay, mean. Okay, yeah. Um, the the fact that it feels like the movement comes out of you, <laughs> you know, rather than it being thought out, it's something that you you instinctively, intuitively feel that your body wants to move in a particular way. And so uh, the yoga gives you a framework, really, to explore different movements. Um, and, and you might be doing a particular movement and then just feel called to do uh, a lunge type, angianasana type stretchy pose, uh, lifting and opening the chest. You, you might feel called to expand the fingers apart uh, and reach and lengthen and uh, and close your eyes and really dive deep into how that feels in the body. Um, you know, and that's something that we don't always get to that point. I think, you know, uh, 
this is a lifelong journey of yeah. me exploring lots of different kinds of movements, lifting weights, running, cycling, triathlon, horse riding, you know, skiing and Pilates, reformer Pilates yeah. and, now, and now yoga. And so uh, you've got a huge repertoire really to call upon. And uh, and so I I can I guess close my eyes and dive into that. So when you dive into it and you approach the mat, mm -hmm. do you try and f do you try and stick to a certain framework, or again do you create your own medley of yeah, yeah. all these different frameworks that you've been exposed to? Over yes, the years? what what you said really. Um, I think if I'm feeling sluggish, I might start standing up and do uh, you know the warm up. That that's always so important. Uh, to even even with yoga, it's not necessarily embedded in the practice to think of it as a warm up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some people might come a little bit unstuck with yoga. You know that um, the not the body isn't prepared for the movements. So somebody new approaching yoga, joining a class, and. Although the movements in the beginning might be more uh, smaller range of movement, they might be more measured in the pace of, at which you move, they, they still can be challenging for people who are new to these disciplines. And so uh, the teacher that I had when I was doing my training, you know, said, we approach it like you would any sport really prepare the body to move and that is something that is as a therapist you know it really is at the foundation of what I teach that uh, if we are moving and taking the body by surprise perhaps or uh, moving vigorously without having prepared the body then then we are vulnerable potentially to injury and and you know and that's something that potentially gets more as uh, as we get older i also find it not being that old myself but <laughs> i I'm, I'm always any activity i do i i do warm up mm. sometimes it's a two minute warm up sometimes 15 minutes but i always warm up um, even if i feel like my body doesn't need it mm. but i always feel like my brain needs it mm. you know some casual movement you know just move with some joints maybe do a couple squats easy stuff but just to get the blood flowing and feeling ready um, psychologically as well as physically mm. um, and and I know it's psychologically because you know how maybe I don't know if um, I'd be happy to hear that you do but you know even if I work even if I'm a, on a um, good momentum working out every day doing something every day but still every one of those days psychologically it's difficult to start start the run start the yoga session that type of thing but post warm-up whether it's two minutes or ten minutes I'm always a hundred percent bought in mm. always so I find that very interesting so it's almost like a it's a physical warm-up practice that gets me psychologically ready to do vigorous things or just challenge myself and dive deep into the session. Yeah. I think we're really making those neurophysiological connections. Uh, especially in modern life, we can be so removed from uh, sensing what is going on in the body. Uh, we spend so much of our day outward looking and and so that shift, the transition to to being in the body and uh, it can take a bit of, like you say, working up to or uh, a, a bit of preparation in order to get to that point. So uh, so it, it absolutely makes sense to me. And that's that's my experience of working with people who, um, you know, movement doesn't come naturally to everyone. That's just a physiological fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, even my own children, uh, I, I have one who is very... Uh, muscular. <laughs> well, he is very muscular now uh, because that's what he's focusing on. But, but he was always very... Uh, had a lot of natural ability so that he could do anything. Surf, ski, uh, kick a football, you know, uh, lacrosse, you know, everything. He yep. could do it. Basketball. He can just do it. 
naturally. And and my other son is much more dyspraxic tendencies. Uh, So kicking a ball and catching a ball was really just not in his wheelhouse at all. Um, And so, you know, we have this innate nature that sometimes means that, you know, those things are so unfamiliar and so um, kind of discomfort. That's the wrong word. Uncomfortable. You know, you, you're exploring an arena where you just don't feel at home comfortable. Yep. And so you're going to shy away from that potentially. But uh, but of course, he didn't have that option in my family. <laughs> he, yep. You can know where I'm coming from. So, you know, some kind of movement was going to be uh, compulsory on a certain level. Yep. Which gives you the those frameworks to explore yeah, movement. Yeah, exactly. So, but I gave him every opportunity of, of variety. So we did gym. He did gymnastics. Uh, he did. Uh, we did mountain biking. We did. He did running. Yeah. You know. And so now he's a very talented athlete, but he still wouldn't be very good kicking or catching a ball. Uh, having said that, he would be better now than ever he would have been if he hadn't had these opportunities to practice skills, because that, you know, movement is a skill at the end of the day. It's not a skill everybody's born with. uh, So yeah, should we be approaching movement as if it's a skill? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you know how you said that you'll almost uh, follow a calling when you approach the mat to make certain movements that you're inspired to do at the moment. I've, um, so maybe when we spoke the first time, I I was maybe too early to face any of these moments that I'll talk about, but I call them like aha moments. Oh, yes. Uh, but I've, yes. I don't know if uh, someone else has uh, coined that term or not, but that's what I use. And I use it too when I uh, talk about yoga to people because it's funny enough, it usually comes when I'm less rigorous with yoga and I don't go three or four times a week, but I take a few days off and then I go back to yoga and then I suddenly like discover something completely like, you know, um, unsolicited where, mm. wow, this is a movement that came so naturally to me. I've like, you know, explored a whole new um dimension or like range of motion that I didn't even know I was capable of doing. I never even thought of moving my body that way. Mm. Um, And then that aha moment just comes. And the more aha moments I have, I feel like bring more aha moments. And those aha moments are all new for me. So Danny, a year ago, had no clue that I could enter these spaces in my body. Mm. So now I'm almost searching for them and almost manifesting them. And because I manifest, because I was manifesting them through yoga, then I felt like I'm I'm actually leaving yoga a bit disappointed because now it's been maybe three four weeks without any aha moments. So <laughs> I feel like I'm losing momentum. So I, when I started doing it myself, mm. I felt like when I'm designing my own session, and it's probably wrong i don't know you know according to all the um to, to how you're supposed to practice or how you're taught to practice let's say mm. but i but it's easier for me to find the aha moments because now if i if i choose to stay in a warrior two pose i can choose to stay there for seven long breaths instead of someone after two breaths moving me to the next exercise so i felt like maybe i'm they're not, not giving me enough of an opportunity to find aha moments um, so I don't necessarily like do my workouts for longer than I would in a yoga studio, mm. but I invest more time on certain activities, not easy ones that I like doing that past the time, but ones that are more likely to give me aha moments because I know which ones I'm like knocking on some door that potentially there's something behind there. So do you, do you still find those aha moments? Oh, well, uh, every day. Yeah. <laughs> You, but yeah, you still feel that? Well, yes, yes, yes. I, but but then I put myself in that position to to have that experience, I think, is the other thing. So, you know, um, I want people to feel that this is an experience they could have for themselves. And uh, what what allows us to do it is the fact that we've, we've practiced a lot over a, a fairly long period of time. Yeah. And so you, you start to understand your body and and know what it needs uh as well as what it wants so 
you know, what you're saying about habit inhabiting a posture for longer means it's more challenging on the musculature, essentially, so that you you kind of sensing that's a good thing for you to to do. And then you've got the opportunity to do it because you're on your own and uh, there's no nobody about to uh, cue you on to the next position. Uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 I do things with other people all the time, a, a video for inspiration, a class that I attend. But when I'm even when I'm doing that and to be, maybe the, the instructors don't like me. <laughs> Because I do freestyle it a bit, I have to say. <laughs> they must hate you. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll, you know, I'll be getting immersed in what we're doing, and 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 sort of think to myself, and I, you know, and I give myself permission to do that. And oftentimes, I'll say to them, you know, if you see me doing something that's a bit different to what you've suggested, uh, it might be because my shoulder's been hurting me, or it might be because of, you know, whatever reason. But I usually give myself that excuse with the instructor that, you know, I can I can be a bit more uh, yeah. intuitive with, with what I'm doing. But, um, you know, the, the thing the thing with movement is that we, you know, we're born to move. The way in which we're designed is we're designed to move um, and the bodies and the brains benefit from doing those things. Um, and so but unfortunately, we don't always have the opportunities in our lives. Uh, women in particular, uh, you know, are inclined to give up sport much sooner in life, uh, the demands of childcare and jobs and such like. So, so people uh, may often the only only um, exposure to activity, physical activity, would have potentially been when they were at school. And uh, you know, the older we get, the further away that is. <laughs> yeah. And so it's harder to draw on that inspiration. But uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that they couldn't get good at this stuff, you know? Um, it's finding your, the, um, the path that is your path. Um, and, but equally, you know, equally there are things that you might think, oh, that's not for me. But then when you try it and you apply yourself to it, it's, it's a bit like that aha moment. So you don't know you're going to like it until you try it. And so, you know, with the Pilates that I teach as well, sort of moving a little bit away from yoga, um, the Pilates that I teach, I've been working with a group of women for two years now on the mat. They come every week. Uh, most of them come every week. And, um, you know, we started off with a diverse group, but predominant, well, they're all women, so they all have that in common. And uh, we're all women above the age of 50 or getting there if we're not already there. And uh, and some, a lot of them were carrying injuries or, uh, you know, a sore this, that or the other when they came. And, you know, they were all over the map when it came to applying uh, discipline to the movements that they make, knowing where the bodies are in space. You know, they were all over the map, not understanding this stuff. And, uh, and so we've been working together religiously over the last couple of years. And this week, because it's January here, uh, well, it's January everywhere, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, that time of year when people think, oh, maybe, maybe it's time that I get myself moving. And I had three new people in, this, in with this same group of ladies. And, you know, it was like turning the clock back uh, with people who They never... were able to see their progress, the people that do show up every yes. week were able to yes. see their progress. Yes, yeah. it was it was absolutely apparent the the massive strides that these women have taken over that period of time. And uh, you know, I, I I would say I can teach anybody this stuff. I don't think you have to be uh, innately that way inclined. I think we can all learn it. And and truthfully I think we all should. Menopause. Oh. You know, you mentioned ladies. You mentioned ladies in their fifties, and um, we can't also sit here obviously without bringing up menopause. So, movement is there? Are there any um, like do for women that 
were or have been active, you know, longer than just their school days, but have stayed active mm. until they approach the age of menopause, do those women have less symptoms or is it easier for them to get through that transitional pay, uh, phase versus women who do who have not who had that? I mean, the struggles that I had, you would have thought that the life that I'd uh, led up until this point at 45 was really going to put me in a good position to deal with this transition uh, seamlessly. You know, uh, I didn't think it should be a problem at all, but um, but it, there was a complete change in the way in which my body was able to cope with the stresses and strains of, of uh, daily life, the stresses and strains of physical activity. And, uh, and so, you know, 25% of women uh, will have severe symptoms. And that's, that's a lot of women. But yeah. I, just to, mm. uh, I remember also from the previous episode, oh, you, yeah. you said, um, which I missed, I think, live listening to you, but oh, okay. from re-listening to it, I heard you said that, but with menopause symptoms, there's no symptom that doesn't respond to movement. Yes, I know. It sounds a little bit kind of counter uh, what I was just saying, but uh, when we're symptomatic, then... I wasn't trying to uh, n- no. complicate your answer, that way. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but when we're symptomatic, then movement can indeed be part, a big part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't necessarily stop you from being symptomatic. So... Uh, so the thing, the things that are happening in your body, uh, the decreasing levels of estrogen. So just thinking about this from the point of view of connective tissue, estrogen um, is is involved in collagen synthesis. It's involved in uh, tenocyte synthesis. So that our tissues are just not as resilient as they might otherwise be. And so my experience was I just used to get the worst DOMS ever uh, after exercise. Yeah. So I, I still did it. You know, it didn't stop delayed me doing onset, it. Delayed onset muscle soreness. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the delayed onset it, muscle soreness was off the scale. And uh, but I didn't I didn't somehow put it down to that, you know, but I knew it was cramps. Cramps came for the first time in my life and the hamstring, you know, was (laughs) grabbing me Mm -hmm. in the middle of the night and you're leaping out of bed. And and this is happening like it never happened before. Yeah. Um, So the fact that I moved, uh, maybe it meant things weren't as bad as they could have been. So certain things like bone health. That's invisible. Uh, you, you're not necessarily symptomatic, but uh, bones are losing. Uh, the bone density is decreasing. And so uh, post-menopause and in that first few years around the time of menopause, um, in the first few years around that time of menopause, the bone density is decreasing markedly. So there's, you know, but you're not going to feel that. It yep. doesn't matter who you are. You're yep. not going to feel that, but it's still happening. Uh, there are things that you will feel, p- could feel, might feel. Um, and the emotional symptoms, you know, that's another thing that you kind of can be caught out by. Mood disruption. And um, and so, y- you know, you, you're feeling aches and pains perhaps that you didn't feel before. So the tendons, because of uh, because of this collagen synthesis being changed, tendons respond differently to movements, and so women who've been exercising regularly might suddenly be experiencing tendinopathies that they, you know, never had before. Commonly, the shoulder, the elbow, the yeah. uh, the hip. So, so this is like mm. one of uh, you know one of many reasons why then it's important for women just to understand this transitional phase so that they can put two and two together when their hamstring is cramping for the first time at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. The forewarned is forearmed. Is you know is the message that I'm really wanting to share with people and um, and and women in particular, but therapists also. Yeah. So that we can put this puzzle together, you know, as a team, 
if you like. Um, being fit and healthy is never going to be a bad thing. It's, it's just that it isn't necessarily going to guarantee that the transition is smooth. Uh, and yep. then, it, and then it's really just exploring what what it is that we can do to address those uh, those symptoms that people might be experiencing. So moving, you might have to approach it in a different way, as you said. Yeah, I was going to add though, because the seventy five percent of women, mm. let's say, who don't uh, have seventy five percent, oh, severe. Yeah. So, so what do we know? Rough numbers of the population of women that don't have or any socially. symptoms that, you know, <clears throat> ride through it like well, um, like nothing ever happened? It, I mean, it's just if you've never asked that question. So the thing is that we have a lot of diverse symptoms that you, you unless you knew that's what that was, you wouldn't put two and two together. Yeah. And, and the there's, there's also invisible symptoms like yes. a woman might yeah, yeah. not know that she's losing, yeah. go, going below certain thresholds of yeah. bone density. Sarcopenia, the, the loss of muscle mass, uh, osteop osteopenia, osteoporosis. These are these are invisible. So we don't know this is going on. Uh, do you think that like, you know, and I, I know it, there's a strong pull to try and change this, to, to, to try and empower girls, women, um, like, you know, there's this whole, and I know it's not everyone, but there's this whole concept of like, uh, you know, uh, like women shouldn't do weights, let's say, because they don't want to be too bulky mm. or, you know, look like a man or anything like that. But but because of that negative, you know, connection to maybe women and movement, you said that most, not most, but a lot of women like will stop doing sports activities mm. um, after they leave school. Do you think that that just puts more women at risk to face more symptoms in the future? Like, for t like what, yeah. what's our message like for I mean, today's girls, you know, today's well, girls going forward to prepare it, in 40 years' time? I think it's it's changed, that whole idea of uh, weights not being for women. I think that's very much changed if you look at Instagram these days. Yep. You know, you'll see lots of body transformations that, that young women have undertaken and they've done it through resistance training. So I do think that's changing for women and, and that the, the realization that muscle it, it doesn't have can be attractive on a woman, yeah. you know. But but also muscles are heavy, right? And then yeah. there's this thing of you know losing weight or maintaining weight. But muscles are heavy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Muscles are heavy, uh heavier than fat. Mm -hmm. But if you've got, you know, this larger body mass and then you're changing the composition. Maybe you don't get quite as much of the of the weight differential, but but the the way your body looks will be so much better. So, and I think that's that's definitely uh, permeating through the the younger women today. I think, you know, what we do know is young people uh, in general are just not as active um, as uh, as they might have been. Yeah you know back when i was young yeah. so <laughs> not to even put even fat. back when i was young <laughs> yeah. you know so, pre uh, you know, pre smartphones yeah that's well that's it so young people are just not quite as active so i don't know it's adolescence you know uh whether and we don't know yes we just don't know yeah. how, how that's going to manifest but you know, I'm I'm very encouraged that the fact that the messages are getting shared out there and that so many people are now consuming those messages, hopefully uh, they'll get a bit more traction. Because also the does the pregnancy experience that a woman goes through, you know, uh, one or multiple, do those experiences later have a connection to the menopause transition? Um well, I mean, it is it is part of that hormonal journey from puberty through to menopause. So you, you can't ignore that clearly. Um, I, I mean, the balance fluctuates around that time also. So women postpartum uh, can be more prone to these tendinopathies also because the estrogen levels have have fluctuated Um as a as a result of that journey through pregnancy, mm -hmm. does it does it change how menopause is going to be? Um, I don't think so. Is the answer, um, you know, 
no, I, I, and to be honest, that's not my sphere of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but for us all to to acknowledge, you know, the 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 pregnancy, the, the hormone levels change, but then go down, but then they come up again, and so that's what doesn't happen at menopause. They're just going down and down and down. So, how was twenty twenty three for you? <laughs> for me, oh well, it was a busy year. Yeah, yeah, busy. Um, Do you spend time reflecting, like when you finished up the year a few weeks ago? Do you spend time reflecting on the on the year you just finished? Yes. Well, I yeah, I do. And, and because I do. just like the um, mm. the ladies that come to your class every week, and I'm yeah. asking you because you know I'm, you're always doing things, always teaching, always learning, right? So sometimes it's like, how do you know how far you've come um, mm. without seeing something to reference yourself to? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because. Um, I'm doing a mastermind with a couple of other, well, three other local business women. And we got together just before Christmas, as it happens. And one of them said, you know, as a as a part of our uh, time together, what's your biggest achievement of 2023? <laughs> and uh, and they, we know each other. So, we, you know, they, yeah. we knew what we'd been getting up to. And um, And I started talking about something. And then one of them said, well, what about when you won that award? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you say, I'd almost mm -hmm. totally forgotten about that. Yep. Which so it is important to take this time to reflect. And what was uh, the award? Oh, personal trainer of the year. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. In Lincolnshire. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I was really thrilled. Actually. I missed that one. I missed yeah, that. Did yeah. You miss we'll that? add it to the um, <laughs> the description of the episode. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, personal trainer of the year, uh, mm. 2023 in Lincolnshire. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that was, um, you know, I was, I had some stiff competition. I, I was up against a young fellow who'd uh, started a business on his family farm, uh, doing outdoor fitness type classes, you know, throwing tires around and that kind of thing. Yeah. And I truthfully, I really did think that he was the one who was going to get the, uh, to get the recognition, but I think what what really swung it uh, for me was the fact that you know I've been doing my own podcast as you as you know, um, and and spreading the word, edu trying to do my best to educate and empower and inform uh, women in particular that uh, you know movement is medicine and menopause is is a really important time for us to embrace movement if we've never. If we've never done it before, then there's no time like around coming up to yeah. and uh, and even beyond menopause. And looking forward, 2024, um, do you set yourself goals that you're trying to, um, not necessarily like what awards you want to win, but <laughs> uh, in terms of things you like are trying to conquer or educate yourself on or complete throughout the year? Well, um, you know, the piece of work that I did around uh, Pilates for menopause um, and the manual that I wrote and the course that we built together, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm really keen to develop that piece of work into something that is either a book or, uh, or a piece of research. So um, I have approached Nottingham University and um, we're going to be having some conversations around that to see, you know, where this work could go moving forwards because, um, you know, there's so much around the training that I did in 2023 um, that really just reinforces my already fairly firm belief <laughs> that the Pilates principles really uh, can support us as we're exploring movements for the first time or coming back to movements after after a, a big break. Um, as a therapist, I always want to help people to move so that they're not going to hurt themselves. And so in rehabilitation, if they have hurt themselves, yep. then uh, we, we start that journey there and move forwards to a place where then they can return to recreational type levels of activity without... Uh, recurrence yeah so recurrence is a big problem 
as therapists. Now, is it a problem because it means you'll always be in a job? Uh, <laughs> well, it's a problem for that person, isn't it? And I think yeah. there's enough people to go around that we can afford to help them to get better forevermore. Ag- you know agreed. I mean? Yeah, yeah, agreed. You know? So, agreed. so uh, what secures longevity in, in rehabilitation? You, you know, what is that? Well, there's a, something around compliance. People actually taking the program, running with it and doing it and not stopping, Mm -hmm. you know, keeping on with these kinds of uh, these kinds of uh, activities and avoiding like things that are maybe causing damage. Oh, well, you you, that's very emotive language that you use Mm. there. Mm, Let me think Mm. about it. Um, so, well, just that word. Yeah. I'm not going to repeat it. The the second word after damage. Yes. (laughs) The D word. Yeah, the D word. Um, Okay. So, you know, people, part of the reason people don't do movements is because of fear of damage. And that in and of itself becomes this perpetuating cycle of pain and problems that we deal with as therapists. Because um, if they're not doing certain movements, then inevitably they're getting weaker, stiffer and more vulnerable to injury. So, um, you know, osteoarthritis is an example And uh, osteoarthritis is uh, the most common chronic condition that uh, and also associated with an aging population. So as we get older, there's there's degrees of osteoarthritis that set in and they say, uh, you know, the research says the mechanism is unclear. Well, I don't. I don't know that it's that unclear. Uh, we have joints that move and things that move will invariably show signs of wear. Yeah. But it's it doesn't have to mean that we can't still continue to move in a safe in a safe way that can be um, without pain. And confidence is a problem. Like this yeah, fear, it yeah, like merges yeah. with confidence, Indeed. right? In, confidence in yourself, um, which for a lot of people could be set by at a very low standard or a very low confidence because of a previous injury um, or because their body maybe quote unquote betrayed them before um, or maybe they read a book or listened to a podcast Mm. and people say avoid this Mm. because of the D Mm. word. But I meant um, like, okay, do you think for a 50 year old man, do you think it's a good idea to go and play football? I'm not saying football with your grandson. That's one thing, but go play football with, uh, with the men. With the men. On the on the Sunday. Yeah, well, uh, the answer depends on whether you've been playing football every week up until that point. Yeah. So assuming it's a yes. Oh, assuming it's a yes. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Well, y- you need to be playing with your peers. Yeah. And the problem is that your peers are, may be falling off at this point and being replaced by the younger sort of breed. Mm. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah and yeah. so then you are in that mixed... Um, demographic which makes everything more unpredictable correct yeah mm. okay so so what's uh, we've got lots yeah. of assumptions no, yeah are no, they so, all the same so age? so if we are all the same you know we're the same uh, guys like uh, yeah, you know yeah. I'm, I'm turning 30 so <gasps> so if i played with this football with the same guys and we move on into our 50s mm. so you're saying that like if we've been playing this long together we've all made the adaptations of you know our all of our speed will get reduced. Mm. We won't be as yeah, quick yeah, no yeah, matter what we yeah. do, right? Um, but as long as we're staying in the same controllable conditions that we're all used to and we're all making that transition together, then there shouldn't be a reason to avoid playing football. No, my husband played into his 50s. And, uh, and you know, I think he still would if there was... <laughs> If, if someone called a, him up, yeah. Yes. Well, he did actually go and yeah. play for my son's team one day. There was short, there was shorter man, and Martin went along, and he said he gave them a run for their money. So, I mean, you know, let's be honest. A lot of younger people are getting physically deconditioned. It's true. You know, so if you've been doing it all along and you've kept up your fitness, then you could probably hold your own. Fair enough. Um, yeah. But you're thinking of knees, probably. Yeah. And knees um, and, an- and ankles. I always. Um, oh, you think of ankles? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, the, the evidence is that if the movements are high velocity, um, then you're more at risk of degeneration. But uh, but if you think about it, you know, walking a long way every day, it, it sort of it's all cumulative. 
So a, a session of football on the weekend might equal, I don't know, three days of walking, say, for instance. So, yeah. um, you know, we've got to keep these things in perspective. And, and I know there's a movement for walking football nowadays. There is. Which, um, which is lovely. Yeah, 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 which is great because it means people can continue to remain active and get that um, companionship or community that you get from doing a team sport. Without popping your hamstring. Yeah, exactly, without popping your hamstring. So uh, all these opportunities, a diverse range of opportunities for people to move, that can only be a good thing. And uh, and to encourage people to, to, you know, keep moving if you've always done it, um, and actually to work harder as you get older. Um, that, that's the thing. We, we find we just have to work a bit harder to stay the same or, or get better. Um, what would you, um, with the University of, of Nottingham, you mm. said you're in touch with? Yes. What is it you would like to, uh, you know, research or be able to access more data on? <sighs> When well, it comes to these things. I mean, the what, thing, what question are we trying to answer? The, well, I haven't quite got that far yeah. yet. I have to say I only was in touch this week. <laughs> but um, well, it's just around the, the idea that um, how we move matters and that anybody can learn it. So um, there's a lot of thinking that, oh, uh, you know, I've heard it said in the staff room when physiotherapists are on the lunch break, uh, oh, you know, that person just will never get this, how to do this particular exercise, how to do it properly, how to do it well. And I think they, they could and and they probably would. It would just take a bit more effort and a bit more uh, support and a bit more of modelling of the behaviour. So, you know, people, um, this, this idea that um, you know, what is it that helps people? What is it that motivates people to be compliant? Uh, the idea that they feel like they've got a, a locus of control, some autonomy in the situation. That's important for us to be able to support people to, to feel that way. Yeah. Um, the other thing is feeling like they're succeeding and, and um, developing uh, becoming more expert at whatever it is that they're doing. So, you know, again, we as therapists can go a long way to contribute to somebody's experience of doing something. And and I had two new people in a class that I taught only this morning, uh, one of which was a gentleman who, you know, was feeling out of his comfort zone very much. Um, but he told me he'd been doing kayaking quite a long time ago but still he'd, he'd been quite good at it and competed and you know so he I knew he had this in him somewhere you know if you've if you've kayaked you've been able to there's some influence within him that wants to explore patterns of movement yeah yeah exactly and and core control is something that he would have had in yeah. in spades so um you know so I knew that and then and then the last thing is that community so that, um, you know, doing it with your clients rather than standing and instructing. There's, there's a lot of evidence. Mirror neurons uh, are really important. So that if we, if we model the exercise and we do it very well, because, that you know, that's the other thing that I'm very keen on is that um, when we are teaching people to move, that we can do it. So... Uh, the biggest thing I've done in my life is this whole lifetime of self-experimentation where, uh, you know, I, if, if, if I haven't done it, I wouldn't ask somebody else to do it. Yeah. So so I can do it is, is the thing. And um, and so we can help them to feel part of something. Uh, if it's a group class, then all to the good, because then they really are part of a community. Um, but my the online classes that I teach, one of the ladies... Uh, yesterday was we were having an interview and she she said well it I, f I feel part of something and she's on her own at home <laughs> you know so it's only in the beginning of the session and at the end of the session mm -hmm. we get you know a bit of time together to wave and say hello and how's the week been and stuff like that but so you know even then uh they're getting something out of it yeah. exercising at home and and so 
uh, if we can be mindful of these things uh, as therapists and uh, and exercise teachers uh, and you know whatever, then then I think the interventions that we deliver will have more impact and potentially get more of that buy-in for people to have that experience of moving can actually make me feel better, less pain, uh, more empowered, more alive, you know, mentally. They both said, the people I was interviewing, I sleep better for doing these classes. Well, that wasn't why they came. You know, they didn't come for a good night's sleep, but now that's what they're getting. You know, so yeah, um, absolutely. So it's it's good stuff, uh, and I really, yeah. just, I really just, you know, how can we get people to really get the buy-in? Yeah, and it, it also, I think there's also an association with movement to mm. working out, to sweat yeah. and tears and yeah, blood, yeah. which doesn't have to be that way, right? It can be, yeah, yeah, yeah. exploring just movement patterns without yeah, yeah, crying yeah. and without uh, forcing yourself to do anything too difficult. Well, I was reading actually one of your uh, your uh, blogs. I think it was a blog post. Um, Mine or well, NAT? Not yours. Okay. The NAT. Thank yeah, God. The NAT. I thought uh, I thought I was getting exposed here. <laughs> no, um, uh, and they were talking about time under tension. Mm -hmm. So time under tension, and the um, in, you know I I was doing my homework as I always am. Sixty seconds was the time that was mentioned, and and that it doesn't have to be about being as hard as as it can be uh, but that exposing tissues to prolonged periods of work and that can be with pulses with holds static isometric holds it can be with um repetitions so it can be low load high repetitions and you know pilates speaks to this yep. and and so does yoga very very well uh, and so I think it's sort of um, poo-pooed sometimes as as not being appropriate, uh, something that came about a long time ago and is no longer relevant. And that and I really don't think that is the case. And I think it, the application to be applied more broadly um, would could really benefit uh, people as they approach therapeutic movement. Or um, or movement at times in the lives when the bodies are perhaps just slightly under par after illness, um, you know, cancer patients perhaps it, it, after treatment, and and women around this time of menopause, but you know, men men don't get away with it either because they're losing testosterone, as uh, you know, and, and so sarcopenia and osteopenia can can come to men as well. So this this stuff is good for everybody. Yeah, it's pretty good medicine. Um, you're trained in the UK as a physiotherapist. Yes. Where do we stand now? Um, you know, we on the podcast a couple of days ago, I spoke to an osteopath and she was saying how today in the educational system for physiotherapists, mm. they're really not exposed almost at all to any manual therapy. And it's oh, really? all, all exercise based. Do you know anything about that? Are you connected at all to what they're teaching nowadays and how they're how they're approaching educating the next uh, cycle generation. of uh, generation of uh, physical therapy or physiotherapists here in well, the UK? Well, I think um, I think if we look at the, our national health system, it is it is a different animal completely than it was when when I was a young therapist. Um, the, the idea that we're trying to empower patients to, to uh, explore movement approaches that they can do on their own at home is, is entirely appropriate. And, uh, and actually, because I work virtually a lot of the time, I don't always have the option to lay my hands on them. So... Then, you know, what is required is for me to get really imaginative in the interventions that we, we explore. So there's a lot that a person could do to their own body, you know, self-massage techniques. The, the, bod the body doesn't know it's you doing it. Uh, and you can, you can stand to gain a lot. I, I demonstrated a, a gua sha technique with a spoon handle 
mm-hmm. to a client this week for uh, epicondylitis online. Uh, oh, that tennis elbow, it won't go away, she's saying. And, and so, you know, I demonstrated a, a manual uh, release technique for the soft tissues that she could then do at home yep. on her own. And, uh, and you know, she did it just for a few moments whilst we were there yep. on the camera. And, she, oh, it feels better already, you yep. know, she was saying. So so I think... Um, but, you're, but you're also mm, a physiotherapist. I am. Even though the NHS was a different animal, which, uh, yeah, which you just, said back yeah. then. But, but still, uh, since then, mm. even though it was a different animal, since then, you've also, I'm assuming, like things like Gua Sha mm-hmm. didn't come through the NHS, but rather you exploring outward to add to your toolkit. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that yeah. didn't come. Th- it came from uh, acupuncture training with, with the um, the Acupuncture Association for Charter Physiotherapists. So um, how is it? How is it now then? Um, it co- did COVID push like this, uh, the telehealth or the uh, telephysiotherapy? <laughs> Well, I think that's accelerated yeah. um, telehealth opportunities for people. Um, I, I, I think I think the experience of therapists in the health service varies, and it depends on the institution where you train. Is the answer to to your question? Um, there's still a lot of manual therapy being taught. It's it's in with the bricks when you are a, a physiotherapist. Um, but I think what's difficult. Different phys- physiotherapists is the fact that we learn all the different disciplines, pediatrics, women's health, uh, musculoskeletal therapy is one of our um, areas of, of study. So invariably, you know, you're spreading yourself a bit thin potentially in a three year course to cover manual therapy at that level. So yeah. it depends on the institution that you study at. I know that they're still teaching it, but um, you know, we did Maitland uh, manual therapy when I when I was a, a a young student, a student physiotherapist and a young therapist. The Maitland approach. Um, what is the Maitland approach? The Maitland, Jeffrey Maitland. <laughs> uh, well, it's a, a, a therapeutic. Let's talk because maybe a physiotherapist is mm-hmm. listening to this who is yes. not tra- not not, not taught sure. the um, Maitland approach in. Uh... Uh, well, it's passive, passive joint mobilizations that a therapist will apply to a, a client. And uh, you can apply them to all the joints, the spinal joints and the peripheral joints. And they're just called uh, Maitland mobilizations or joint mobilizations. And so there's a direction uh, of, of uh, thrust or force and there's an amplitude of movements. So you can grade the movements that you make according to uh, small amplitude and uh, and larger amplitude and then the the amount of force that you apply to those to those joints. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I still use Maitland today. I was using it yesterday actually on somebody. So um so that maybe that some institutions will favor that and then others there's um manual energy techniques METs yeah muscle energy techniques muscle yeah. thank yeah. you I, I knew that was wrong um there's a whole host of m- manual therapy techniques and I don't think that they're not doing it but I do think that in therapeutic um encounters in the national health service hospitals that we You know, we have to make the most of those moments together and passive treatments like therapists uh, performing manual mobilizations uh, have a part to play, but it's not the whole story by any chalk of the imagination. And so, you know, it may be that the therapy is erring more towards movements now. I'm all for that. You know, I think I said that. I'm all for that because there's a lot of evidence that exercise, therapeutic exercise is the way to go. And that putting your hands on patients to do passive treatments, if that's all that we do for them, then they they come to rely on us. And and they don't feel part of that therapeutic alliance in the same way. Now, people love it. Don't get me wrong. Who wouldn't? Yep. Who wouldn't? We we all love that idea of being tended to. Yeah, I got my neck cracked a there couple of days go. ago. <laughs> and it and it absolutely has a part to play. Yeah. 
Uh, but I, you know, I favor this multifaceted approach that includes soft tissue techniques. Uh, it includes muscle energy techniques. It includes yeah. mobile, passive joint mobilizations and uh, taping technique. You know, you name mm -hmm. it, acupuncture. I was yeah. doing a bit of auricular mobilization. So how do you, how do you like um, approach when you when you sit down with someone mm -hmm. and you can like you, you're starting to grasp maybe what you know some issue is or maybe something we need to work on together. Um, but you know all the, the the different things that you're mentioning. You know, m movement as a medicine. Mm probably doesn't have to be, but I'm, a lot of the time it's probably a long-term thing where, all right, we're going to work on something. You will get better and you will feel better and you will sleep better and all these things. <laughs> it's going to take time and effort and discipline versus, I don't know, go to a chiropractor and feel better get instantaneously. Clung. Well, that doesn't always happen, I true, have to say. True, uh, true. <laughs> but for the ones that do, you know, like even yeah. me, maybe which is not the case. I didn't have any neck issues, but no. I did get my neck cracked. Yeah. But if I did have a neck issue and I did get my neck cracked and it did relieve that pain, I can see myself just wanting to make that. an appointment yeah. next time and yeah, next time yeah. and next time. And then that's my solution for my neck problem. Instead of uh, stopping a second and I'm trying to understand, okay, what Why? is the problem here? Mm. And how can we avoid me making appointments every week? Yeah. Like you said, there's probably, uh, there's enough people out there with pain for you to solve people's <laughs> issues, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, it's getting the results there and then in the, in the therapy session. And, and it may be that a mobilization does it. But, um, you know, I was working with somebody yesterday and it was about uh, let's test, let's retest, let's do something. And I quite like to be able to improve something um, by, by tackling something that's a bit... Um, maybe left of field, shall we say. So, Can you um, paint a picture? Yeah. This, so, um, you know, when people are convinced it's a joint problem, yeah. oh, it's my joint. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and that's... Labels, are we like labelling? <laughs> that's okay. But if I work on a muscle and that, so, that makes the joint feel better, then... Is it really a joint problem? And and I think that's really important when it, it comes back to this idea of damage, you know, because knees, hips, backs, damage, it, it's a real burden for people to carry around with them. And so if we can work on a muscle and all of a sudden they think, oh, that hurts less, I can move more, then is it really just the, is it really the joint? Yeah, do we really have to be so worried about the joint? And so then they can say, oh, okay, maybe it's okay then, you know, perhaps I can do these exercises and, yeah. you know, so then you get the buy-in. And uh, I was working with a bodybuilder a couple of weeks ago and he'd hurt himself at the gym, uh, working when fatigued, bench pressing, bench pressing when fatigued and yeah. then following it with pull-ups. And, you know, he's heavier than me, so obviously he's like, well, not that I can do a pull-up, I have to say, but, <laughs> you know, you can... I mean, he was lifting quite a lot yeah. if it was a full body uh, pull up and something, you know, something did that. And he was not a happy bunny at all when I saw him. Um, so when you have that experience, you think something's gone and you feel a bit broken. Um, but, the you know, I was able to use the uh, shoulder symptom modification approach to show that if we use the rubber band, if we gave uh, the rubber band sensory feedback around the back of the wrist, if we made a fist, if we, if we made it a short lever movement instead of a long lever movement, uh, and if we added a lunge so that we then harness the extended kinetic chain, that he could then lift his arm without pain. And that's, um, that's where the body is very interesting, right? Because like, um, you know, standing straight, I might be very weak lifting up my, my left arm with resistance, but a, sw a slight tweak of alignment or, mm. you know, maybe you moving the, as a physio moving me in a, s a slight tweak and suddenly all the power is there. Yeah, yeah. So, so is it the body protecting? Is, that, is, it, the, the, is it the body 
protecting us in a certain way, when it's putting us out of alignment, because there's, there's something in some chain somewhere that has an issue, so the body is avoiding you, maybe using that part of, you know, um, as a force generator to mm. push something away. I, I don't think it's part of a protective mechanism. It's definitely secondary consequences to... Uh, that that has the potential to be secondary ramifications of something that's happening somewhere else in the chain. It's not necessarily desirable for that to happen, um, and hence why it hurts. It's almost like a that's a symptom for yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea that um, an elite cricketer could have a shoulder problem on the right because of a tight tendoachilles on the left. Uh, and so if he hadn't had that tight tendoachilles on the left, we could surmise that he would he may never have got this shoulder problem on the right. Yeah. So so you know, this puzzle gets more and more uh complicated if if the more we delve into it. Uh, you know, and that's kind of what, what I love. Yeah. You were asking me, you know, what's on the agenda for this year, and <laughs> more learning is is always on the agenda so that I can uh, understand the body better uh, for me because, uh, you know, I've got a body too. <laughs> Do you have any planned experiments this year that you're going to play with? Uh, planned, ex well, I'm, I'm going on a yoga retreat. Okay. Yes. That's fun. I know. A Where? whole week in April. Uh, well, Alicante I'm going to just because the flights are easy. Uh, I have to take that into account when I'm only going for a week. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's going to be warm. So Beautiful. I'm going there, yes. Have you done a yoga retreat? No, never. Wow. No. So stepping outside of your comfort zone. Well, no, I'll be very comfortable, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I, but you're going to have to tell the instructor that you may, may. follow exactly the, <laughs> the, the rules. Um, <laughs> before we finish up, I wanted to uh, ask you, I don't know if you noticed, this is something fairly new, if you've listened to the last few episodes, but I've been challenging my guests uh, with the last question. Um, it's really like, a, it's a way to maybe, you know, just an example um, to sh to share with the with the listeners on something that you know maybe two months ago or twenty years ago you were set in stone that this is the way to do it, uh, but now you're it changed your mind completely. So if you can point a finger on something like that, I think it's just useful because there's someone listening now that maybe thinks they have it all figured out because. In 2023, every patient they saw, they were able to fix their problems. Um, so this is the way to go moving forward. Uh, maybe it will allow, well, your story will allow them a moment to self-reflect and maybe start thinking about, okay, what is it maybe I don't know? What am I not looking at? Even though maybe everything I am looking at is in place and correct, what am I not looking at? Well, the, the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years has... Um has led me to really be curious about the contribution of the central nervous system and uh, and and to to think about the therapeutic dialogue a lot more than I ever might have done before um, as, what, do you, what do you mean by the therapeutic dialogue well the words that we use interesting you bring that up okay carry on <laughs> Well, the D word, you know, yeah, you yeah, mentioned yeah, yeah. earlier. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I've been a physiotherapist for too many years, more than I care to mention. Um, and y you do think you've got it figured all, all figured out. And uh, it's as simple as if you do what I tell you to do, it'll work. And, uh, and why don't you just go and do it? Uh, you know, I'm, I may have been guilty of, of a bit sort of black and white thinking um, and and the expert uh, thinking of myself as, as the expert in this interaction, if you like. So, um, you know, guess what? The patient is the expert in their body. They know their body uh, better than I do. They've had it longer than I've been with it, you know. And, and to sort of give them more credit. 
And then to really, really enter into a therapeutic alliance with people. Um, the language that we use is really so important um, in the messages that we convey to clients, in the way in which they then approach their recovery or even their health and wellness journey. Uh, so I guess I alluded a little bit earlier on to to some of the things that, you know, I'm I'm beginning to really work to incorporate into the work that I do, yep. give, giving people that um, autonomy um, and and then the, uh, you know, this success that is so important to secure the buy in and then that sense of community. Uh, feeling that they're really included, you know, in this relationship that yep. we have. And I know, I, I, I think it's still the, the case that physiotherapists, and I can only speak for physiotherapists, are not receiving as much of that kind of uh, the, the education around the psychodynamics of the therapeutic interface. So, um, you know, if if that's um, motivational interviewing is something that could really help us to to get the results, because particularly if you're working for yourself, re results matter. <laughs> People spreading the word that you get results yeah. um, matters, um, and so you know, getting a bit you, <laughs> using a bit of the grey matter to get the results. Uh, that the patients want because it's all very well us thinking well you need to do this but what do they want so that that's the thing that i've been working lately much the, harder to do the patient is the expert yeah of their own body yeah um well i think it's um it's 240 um so we'll wrap up the episode um thank you very much it's episode again 40 so it's a big one um i was excited to do it and so hopefully less than 30 episodes from now i can uh, <laughs> hopefully we can uh, do part three awesome. um because i did have some uh pregnancy questions um surrounding movement with pregnancy which we touched on a little bit 30 episodes ago and not very much on today but i, I do want to dig uh, down that uh, rabbit hole uh because i but, you know, you said Instagram, females, mm. you see, I've been seeing a lot and I follow a lot of women who have been showing the world like throughout their pregnancy, oh, yeah. how active they really are. Yeah. Um, but you also see how negative their reaction and the comments oh, are. Yeah. You're, you're, I you're, you're see killing, one of those. You're killing yeah. your baby, you're doing, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of inspiration there and a lot of um, unexplored science. Mm. as well yeah, uh, which yeah, can be definitely. very interesting so hopefully we can explore that in the future okay. um a pleasure being here with you thank you very much i'll give you a chance just to say again uh precision with a z with z um to tell people where they can find your content where they can find you obviously you're on neilasher.com as well um but you have your platforms your podcasts so please oh thank you uh precision.co.uk with a z uh, as you said and uh, my podcast on my youtube channel at Move with Philippa. There's some movement stuff on there too. And uh, I'm really having fun uh, exploring all these different uh, technologies. And my YouTube channel is on my list of things to grow this year, actually. So do have a look at me on YouTube. And uh, and the podcast on Audible. Uh, I said on Audible. I don't mean that. Spotify? No, I, it's the... Um, the Apple Podcasts. I don't know why I, I didn't know that. Apple Podcasts. Yeah. Yep. Apple Podcasts. Uh, Moving through menopause, I'm called. And uh, I, have, I speak with generous guests who share their expertise. So we talk about all sorts of uh, symptoms, how we can help ourselves with food, with movement, with mindful approaches, uh, aromatherapy oils, you name it, we cover it. And uh, and so, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me on again. It's been a pleasure to, to meet you again and chat. Thank you very much, Philippa. Thank you. <laughs>